If you have spent any time conducting operations in the real world, or even just like binge-watching Black Hawk Down, you might have learned about a critical part of any military operation, and that is the Tactical Operations Center, or TOC. So what is a TOC? In short, a Tactical Operations Center is a focal point, a physical location, where all communications, intelligence, weather, and command functions are conducted for any operation. TOCs can vary widely in construction and mission type based on the level at which the TOC is situated. TOCs can also go by other names, depending on the agency or military group that they are for. For instance, in the U.S. Navy, most TOCs are actually called MOCs, or Maritime Operations Centers. In a joint environment with different service branches operating in the same battle space, the term often used is the JOC, or Joint Operations Center. These are all pretty much the same thing, but technically these are all ever so slightly different entities. For instance, Navy MOCs are often more strategic in nature, with much larger areas of responsibility. This is just due to the nature of a land-based command structure being responsible for large chunks of the world's oceans. On the other hand, some TOCs can be a small tent in a patrol base, with only a couple of people staffing them, being responsible for a much smaller area of operations. The concept of the TOC is also present in civilian agencies as well. Fire departments, wildland fire crews, police departments, even larger medical facilities all usually have some form of tactical operations center which functions just like their military counterparts, albeit with obviously different missions. There is even an entire incident command system, a collection of civilian-based doctrine to organize and command civilian incidents. We'll talk more about that in the future, but for today we're mostly going to speak of talks that cater more to military operations. And speaking of operations, what is a talk used for, and why is it needed? In most military structures, the talk is the nerve center for operations. In short, it's the place to be if things are going down and operations are going on outside the wire. If a person has any impact on the mission at hand, but isn't actually going out on the mission, chances are they're going to be in the talk. The talk is the focal point for everything that might be needed during that operation. Due to Hollywood, we thankfully have a pretty good idea of what a talk is used for, even if we might not know it. However, if we crack open some warfare publications, we can clearly list the six basic functions of a talk, which are to receive information, distribute information, analyze information, make recommendations to the commander, integrate resources, and synchronize resources. To meet all of these objectives, ideally a talk should contain representatives from all of the staff functions of a military unit. So running down the list, we should see command and administration, intelligence, operations, supply, medical, and communications, and sometimes other departments depending on what kind of unit you are supporting. However, a lot of times we will see medical and supply not have physical representation in the talk. Due to the nature of their jobs, medical personnel will mostly be stationed at their medical facility, and supply personnel will be at their staging areas and storage facilities, both of which will have a direct line of contact via radio or field telephone to the talk. This also applies to the six shop guys, or the communications or signals personnel, who can usually do their job of maintaining IT networks from their own offices separate from the talk as well. At minimum, in any talk at any level in any military, you will have operations staff manning the radios and tracking the good guys, intelligence personnel doing their thing tracking the bad guys, and some kind of command element orchestrating and directing everyone. Remember, there are large volumes of military doctrine that dictate exactly what the functions and responsibilities of the talk are, spelled out in excruciating detail. So if you want to learn more, check out the military doctrine on the subject. A lot of senior ops guys absolutely salivate at the chance to talk about battle rhythm, turnover briefings, battle staff functions, battle update briefs, commander update briefs, and endless other topics that most people have no interest in, especially a civilian audience. So here today we're not going to deep dive into the world of operations, we're only going to cover the highlights as well as the things that matter in the real world for most civilian operation centers. So let's explore some of the roles a talk has during operations. First up is communications. Talks are the place where communications are centralized so that the commander, operations staff, intelligence personnel, and any other support staff can be kept up to speed regarding what's going on with an operation. Communications are piped in from any relevant entity and available for use as needed. In the days of old, this might have looked like this, a switchboard for various field telephones, all routed through the unit's area of operations to each unit that needs to maintain a direct line back to the commander. In today's world, however, most military units simply place a radio watch in the talk. 
with various RTOs, or radio telephone operators, manning the radios around the clock 24-7, even when no operation is being conducted. Remember, the talk is functional even if everyone is back at the base, for coordination reasons we'll talk about next. Radio watching the talk is usually looked down upon as a necessary evil, a task that no one really wants because it's usually boring, but is desperately needed in the event of an emergency or during an operation. You never want to have a situation in which someone is screaming on the radio for a medevac and there's no one there to hear them. Other than radios, talks are usually going to have the feeds for any sensors that are available to a unit, as well as some form of shared network. In military circles, this is going to be the place where your Nippernet, Sippernet, JWIX, NSANet, or whatever networks you're using all come together to be used however they are needed. For a talk set up and being run by a prepared citizenry, this is probably going to mean an internet connection. You know how we have been talking about SIGINT collection and listening posts and observation posts and radio stuff? The talk is where all of that information is going. In other words, your talk is your information hub, a place for multiple sources of information to come in, all via different communications methods. Another main mission of the talk is coordination. Talks serve as the coordinating entity for anything a team might need while out on a mission. Somebody gets shot and needs a medevac? That nine-line request gets radioed directly back to the talk, who then sends it to the Kazavac or medevac entity on call for that area of operations. You could have observation posts with ADSB receivers tracking aircraft all throughout the area, and these observation posts could be spread out far enough to where they're covering a much wider area than just the talk could alone. This information could be shared from talk to talk all across the nation or even the world. Or the talk alone could have the ADSB plane tracking setup, sending messages to operators in the field, letting them know a suspect aircraft is approaching. This coordination is also very helpful if you have different people operating in your area and you need to coordinate travel or logistics or lodging. Any of these things can be handled from a talk in a pinch if a dedicated administrative office doesn't exist. This is why a radio watch is so important and why talks function 24-7 even when no operations are actually ongoing. You never know when something outside of your area of responsibility will suddenly be inside your area of responsibility. This will directly impact battle tracking. One of the main missions of TOC staff is to battle track what is going on throughout the area. This can be as simple or as complex as needed. In smaller TOCs, battle tracking could be as simple as a map on the wall, a common operating picture, showing the area of operations with pins for the good guys and pins for the bad guys. And as the good guys move around on their mission, TOC staff update their locations on the map. This is quite literally how generals have commanded their staff as far back as recorded history itself. In more sophisticated roles, however, we can see that this can be pretty easily automated. The TAC suite of software and applications basically does this for you, with every team member running ATAC and WinTAC being run in the talk from a computer with a projector, we've got the ability to view the battle space, view where our team is located, and if they find the bad guys and mark them, we know where they are at too. Everyone in the talk being able to visualize this all at once on a common operational picture is very handy and is a standard of any operations center. Battle tracking should also incorporate understanding what your tactical neighbors are up to. Being able to understand what operations are being conducted in areas adjacent to you is also necessary. Remember, the guys out on patrol or kicking in doors for you aren't going to give a flying flip what the team in the next grid square are doing. They are focused on their mission, their city, their street, their house, and their doorway. But remember, warfare does not follow lines on a map. It is the operations staff in the talk that must care about what goes on around the team and what is going on around their AOR. This is something that the US military in particular is horrible about doing. The most common fratricide incidents have occurred because a unit was unaware of a different friendly unit operating in their area. This stuff happens. But it shouldn't happen if the guys in the talk are doing their job and maintaining relationships with everyone who might potentially operate in their area. Again, this is a huge failing of the military in general. Inter-service rivalries, or the inability or lack of desire to even walk across the compound and shake hands with a different unit, has led to a lot of good Americans getting killed by their own people. So this is one of those things that we can try to correct from the perspective of civilian life, like running talks in our own neighborhoods. Switching gears quite significantly, we come to another major use for talks, and that is weather. Usually talks are where the weather nerds work for a very good reason. As I myself have tried to drive home again and again, 
Weather is, by far, the most deciding factor for military operations around the world. Weather is the most decided resource for go or no-go criteria for most military operations. Weather can ground a fleet of aircraft, or it can stop an amphibious landing the size of Operation Overlord. Weather can render billions of dollars worth of sensors useless, and weather can prevent medevacs from being possible. This is why weather usually gets a seat right up front in the talk, because when it comes time to conduct an operational briefing, the weather guy always goes first. This is because if the weather is bad and the mission is a no-go, nobody wastes their time going to a brief that's not needed. Next up is intelligence. Intelligence personnel may spend a lot of their time squirreled away in skiffs, but when it comes to actually conducting operations in the real world, you will find an intel guy in every talk at all levels. In a phrase echoed by intel dudes as a way of remaining relevant, intelligence drives operations. Or at least that's what's supposed to happen. Towards the end of the GWAT era, and certainly a major factor in today's military forces, it's often the other way around. Some general or commander wants to make their mark on the battle space with their ego, and the intel guys have to scramble to retroactively find reasons to raid a particular target or conduct a particular strike. We have all seen what happens when revenge or an operation needs to drive the intelligence. It's not pretty. But in a more civilian role, intelligence can do what it needs to do and have a lot more breathing room in a civilian talk. Intelligence reveals that bad guys are staging at location X. Well, that's where the operation's going to go. We get some SIGINT that indicates an adversary is setting up checkpoints in our area. The operations staff can use their personnel, equipment, and platforms to get the intel guys the information they need. We don't need to pick a spot and figure out a reason to go there. We can actually decide what we want to do based on the intelligence that we have. In a civilian talk, the adversarial relationship between operations and intel doesn't need to exist, especially if the talk is not under direction from higher. For intelligence personnel, that talk is where most work gets done. Remember, if the goal is for intelligence to drive operations, intelligence staff need to have a pretty large role in every talk. As an operation goes on, intel staff are right there to help guide the operation. In many cases, this is not necessary. Once intel prepares the target and operations staff figure out how to make it happen, it's out of intel's hands and the S2 shop can sit back and watch. However, in highly dynamic operations where the mission is expected to change as it happens, intelligence needs to have a more active role. But again, in real life, this rarely works out this way in most military organizations. So we've examined the roles and responsibilities of the talk. Now let's take a look at some of the equipment and features that make all of this possible. First up, you need a map, a rather large one too, or a computer with a projector that can be used to display your common operating picture. This is basically just a map of your area with various information that you might need to know. If you've got personnel outside the wire, that information is going to go there. If you detect surveillance sensors in your area, or if you know enemy forces are massing in some location, that location will go on the map as well. It's just a shared map that everyone can dump their data on as needed. A separate large map of the entire theater is also helpful for people operating in your area that might not be familiar with the geography. So if you've got some dudes coming down to your area to work with you for a bit, you can take them into the talk and show them the area of operations. Key landmarks, stuff like that. Maybe even various Galanda Talfa if that's something you implement in your operations. Up next, radios and communications. Of course, one of the most important aspects of any talk is communications. Talks are great communications nodes due to the variety of communications methods housed within. For instance, the radio operator could get in a message from an adjacent district via HF radio, and the operator can pass that communication to the rest of the talk, as well as anyone who might need it out in the field via a different radio. This is probably best illustrated by our video on Warlord Radio, so go check that out if you're interested in learning about the communications needs of a headquarters set up in the backcountry. Anyway, the communications factor alone will turn any talk into a beehive of activity, with everyone scurrying around contributing their part to the mission. Though this is something to be mindful of. Most people refer to talks as artillery magnets, for good reason. The nature of the talk, with all of its communication signals whizzing through the air, mean that talks are juicy targets for an adversary, and are also very easy to find most of the time. From the perspective of the US military, who has gotten used to counterinsurgency in the Middle East, 
Keeping your talk from being leveled instantly in a war zone is a skill that certainly needs to be worked on a bit more. This is why the bane of everyone's existence at NTC is when unit leadership says, alright, we're jumping to a new location. But again, from a prepared citizen perspective, there are some things we can do to be a bit more secure than even the average military unit. Up next is support staff. Depending on the unit and the mission set, this can vary widely. If the unit is an air cav unit, the support staff might include senior maintenance staff or representatives from a recovery team in case an aircraft fails or crashes on an objective. For infantry units, you might have a couple of targeting guys working with the intel guys to produce targets, or you might have logistics personnel taking a larger role for units stationed in more remote areas where logistics is the most hindering factor for operations. In any case, you're going to find support staff taking a seat in pretty much every talk, depending on what the mission is. Up next is leadership. Leadership is an important part of a functioning, efficient talk. In the professional talk, there is always one operations officer that is in charge of talk operations, serving as the talk's representative to outside units, higher leadership, and anything else that might be needed. In military organizations, this person is usually referred to as the battle captain, not necessarily due to pay grade, but due to organizational authority. The battle captain usually has a battle NCO who usually handles some of the more routine operations and helps things move smoothly. The battle NCO is also responsibility for maintaining order in the talk, which is important. A lot of times, if a high-profile operation is going down, a lot of spectators will show up to watch and crowd the talk, or make it hard to hear the radio, stuff like that. So it's the battle NCO's responsibility to keep things running smoothly so that talk personnel can do their job efficiently. This really isn't an issue for smaller organizations, but maintaining an efficient, professional talk is something that everyone can benefit from, no matter how small your organization is. Remember, the tiniest bit of professionalism goes a very long way. So if you have outside groups or people visiting your talk for joint operations, you want everyone who visits to walk away thinking, man, they've got a slick operation here. I wouldn't mind working with them again. Another major need is power. A lot of electrical power generation capability is needed to power the wealth of electronics that are necessary for operations to be efficient. Technically, you could build a talk the old school way, with large printed paper maps and sheets of acetate to create overlays. In our modern world, we also have products like the battle board and even our homemade map cases that can make it easier to display a picture of the operational area, without using computers or a projector. However, at minimum, you are going to need power for the radios and for lighting. And since the talk is the nerve center for any operation, chances are you will rapidly find out that you never have enough power for your needs. Most of the time in military organizations, these power needs are met with generators, and that's that. That can work for a more civilian approach, but for most people, their power needs in the backcountry or even in just an urban area, they're going to be met with solar panels and batteries. And trust me, as soon as those panels come out and the batteries are charging, everyone and their cousin will show up saying, hey man, have you got somewhere to charge my phone? Or radio? Or batteries for night vision devices? Or GPS devices? Or headlamps? The list is endless. Since talks are usually the central point in any encampment, it's quite common for groups of people to contribute their solar panels to pitch the talk. So if you've got 10 guys rucking into the backwoods, each of them carrying a solar panel and one guy carrying the battery, everyone can daisy chain their panels together to power the talk. Though, if this route is taken, it's only fair to provide a charging station for everyone's devices. So, dedicating a small corner to a USB hub and a battery charger or two would be a very welcome addition to any talk. Up next are quality of life items. Seeing as the talk will be where various personnel spend most of their time, various quality of life items are handy to make the workspace more comfortable. All of the pogey stuff like coffee pots, snacks, powdered drink mixes, and other quick-to-eat food items frequently find their way into the talk one way or another. In larger talks, microwaves and refrigerators are also frequently found, along with various canteen items like energy drinks, snacks, and other stuff being sold on an honor system. Now I must step back for a moment and comment on talk culture. This is the exact kind of thing that brings about a lot of animosity for talk personnel for understandable reasons. In military organizations, the pogue stuff can get out of hand really quickly and the talk can become a cush office rather than a hardcore, death-dispensing watch floor. Imagine if you're a grunt who has spent the better part of a week sleeping in a hole, eating MREs for months prior, 
and you stop by the talk for a minute to find people sipping caramel macchiatos and microwaving food from cute care packages, and wrapping themselves in sweaters because that air conditioning is just a little chilly. Understandably, this is going to result in a lot of animosity being generated. The number one cause of conflict between grunts and talk personnel is the lifestyle, either real or perceived. On the other hand, people who do not work in talks often do not understand that talk personnel often work really, really long hours with 12 to 16 hour shifts being the standard. Guys out in the field see the talk as a nice, comfortable office, and that's quite true. What they don't see is the strung out personnel who've been working 16 hour days for weeks just to plan and execute that three hour mission they just went on. Living this lifestyle for years will break a person. So as with anything, there's give and take on both sides of the wire. Having a coffee pot in the corner or a box with some MRE snacks in it is perfectly fine. But it is also the responsibility of talk personnel to make sure that their work center remains a work center, not their living room like at home. So if you don't want to be made fun of, keep the pogue stuff to a minimum. Likewise, it's the responsibility of the hitters that don't work in the talk to realize that just because a person works in the talk doesn't mean they don't work. No dude with a rifle and cool pants will ever do their job without the dudes in the talk, so an environment of mutual respect is required. And having a lot of pogue stuff cluttering up your work center erodes this respect. So we can see how cultural, social, and personal issues can have a real impact on operations. It might seem a bit trivial to talk about this stuff, but it's real. And these morale and social issues have impacted real-world operations more than you could possibly know. So it's worth getting this stuff out in the open now so that everyone is aware of how a simple microwave can cause a fistfight. Now, all of that being said, I myself usually maintain a secret stash of snacks, candy, coffee, coffee cups, cutlery, baby wipes, and so on. All of this being purely for bribery purposes. I guess this points more to my own career and experiences as an intel guy than anything else, but I myself have many times had to debrief personnel in the talk rather than a dedicated briefing area. Most of the time, people avoid the talk like the plague, either for pogey reasons or because leadership is usually there. So a lot of times your debrief is, here's what we've got, here are a couple of notes, I'm out. And then somebody like me has got to take the time to track down people all over the compound because I have questions about something. So a piping hot pot of fresh ground coffee passed around by the team is a great way to entice personnel to settle down and give me the information that I need from their mission. Also important to consider, and similarly along these lines, is the stuff that no one remembers or even wants to remember, and that is housekeeping items. At the risk of echoing every sergeant major ever, a clean talk is a happy talk. Sort of. No amount of bleach and scrubbing will make anyone proficient at their job, but cleanliness is still very, very important. If you have a coffee pot in your talk, as is pretty much mandatory, you will have spills. You will have people just being generally messy. If you don't have air conditioning with all of those server stacks and laptops running, it's gonna get hot, and the smell of feet and despair will fill the air if you let it. If you are running a talk out of a tent in the middle of nowhere, people are going to track in mud and dirt like crazy. And since talks are high traffic areas, a lot of dirty, crusty dudes moving through it will make a great breeding ground for filth and sickness. You are going to catch the crud if you don't keep yourself clean. Again, from a civilian perspective, we living a civilian life don't have the luxuries of a military unit training for a week or two in the field. A military unit who is 100% focused on their mission can be filthy for a week, a month, or even a year in the field if need be. But we citizens who will probably be running a talk part-time over a period of potentially many consecutive years while having a full-time job and a family life, being filthy and catching a field flu every couple of weeks is not responsible. So at minimum, you will need some basic cleaning supplies, enough to keep your work center tidy. Some antibacterial spray and some wipes go a long way and are great for sanitizing desks, computers, radios, light switches, you name it. An air freshener also goes a long way to keep the stank at bay, and are always a welcome addition to any talk. Recognizing the role a talk has, you aren't really going to be able to keep the floor clean if you are operating in a remote location. So having things set up off the floor is going to be necessary not only for ease of use, but to also make sure that your radios and computers don't get covered in mud. In any case, we really do have to accept that a talk, especially in a remote location, is not going to be spotless. However, we should really be looking to keep things as neat and relatively free of crud as much as possible. Something also helpful to have is a private area. 
In a military sense, privacy takes a backseat to literally everything. But if you find yourself in a leadership position, a private area to discuss things will be a godsend. A dedicated briefing area adjacent to, but not inside the talk, would be very helpful for getting salute reports, or debriefing team members, or just generally dumping information after getting back to base. Having this area located away from the talk keeps the distractions at bay for the guys and gals that are working in the talk. A separate debriefing area might also be handy for more delicate needs, such as the need to debrief a team without worrying about the consequences of what anyone might say. This is especially necessary for intelligence personnel who need the truth and not the story dictated by the boss. These examples, which are totally not specific to my own experiences, really illustrate the situations in which a more private area near the talk but also out of earshot, might be handy to have. If your team is big enough, a private area off to the side of the main operations center might be handy for compartmentalizing information too. Information that is relevant to a unit, but also might be something that not everyone needs to know, has to be stored somewhere. It is highly unlikely that a civilian team will need a skiff or a special access program area, but who knows. Compartmentalization of information is arguably even more important for the prepared citizen, so I just wanted to throw that out there and mention that a small tent or even just a curtain you can pull around a computer in the corner of a talk could be helpful for keeping eyes-only information where it needs to be. Other stuff you might need are random support stuff. Mostly what I mean is stuff you need right freaking now and you cannot wait to retrieve from supply or from a cache or whatever. Things like water, batteries, a set or two of binoculars, office supplies like pens, paper, markers, uh, maps, other little expendable stuff that you often need very quickly. Minor repair items like duct tape or zip ties or paracord will be very handy to have as well. At some point, somebody's going to come into the talk asking, hey man, you got something to fix this with right quick? Be very careful though. You do not want to turn your talk into a storage area. Granted, for a more civilian setup, that's exactly what ends up happening, and that's perfectly okay, but you want to do what you can to provide a dedicated quick access supply area that's not right up front in everybody's way, and not distracting when people access it. And finally, a clearing barrel and or a weapons rack. For larger talks in a more tactical environment, having a dedicated weapons storage rack and or a clearing barrel will make everything easier and probably safer as well. You don't want a rifle to slip off of a desk and negligently discharge, or more likely, you don't want some sharp part of a rifle to scratch your computer screen when somebody squeezes past you. Since talks are not supposed to be on the front lines, all of the talk staff having their rifles in a rack is usually perfectly fine. Makes it very convenient to walk around what is essentially a tactical office without getting caught up on stuff. Now that we know what a talk is, what work gets carried out there, what personnel usually work in one, and the equipment that is needed to make all of this happen, let's go over some things to think about from a civilian perspective. As with most military doctrine, the idea of the talk isn't perfectly compatible with a prepared citizenry. As usual, when we try to cut and paste military doctrine into a more citizen-based organization, we find that things don't always fit perfectly. And when that is the case, we have a lot of groundbreaking to do. The military concept of the talk goes back to the origin of warfare itself, but in today's unique situation, both here in the U.S. and around the world, we are really on our own. We simply have to develop a lot of this doctrine ourselves. So when it comes to the things you need for a civilian talk, we here are learning along with all of you as well. But all of that being said, here are some things to think about if you want to set up one for yourself. The first consideration is whether or not you even need a talk in the first place. Operations centers are usually pretty big by comparison, just by the number of personnel alone. Even at the smallest level, we're talking anywhere from 5 to 15 or so people working in the talk at any given time. And these people are usually in the talk to track operations that again involve a dozen or so other people at a very minimum. But talks can potentially involve hundreds of people managing very large operations. In other words, the talk staff alone is probably going to involve more people than most prepared citizen groups even have. So in that case, is the idea a swing and a miss for the civilian sector? Is it even worth it to introduce the idea as something that might be useful for a prepared citizen? I think the answer is yes. The talk, while mostly a military thing that involves a lot of people, can easily be flexed to be a helpful addition to any operation whether or not you realize it. For most neighborhood groups, or even just a couple of friends, neighbors, or family members getting together, they aren't going to need a full-blown talk. 
At most, you might need one location to operate out of. And you might not even call it a talk. You might set up a base camp with a tent specifically dedicated to holding your larger radios, your HF radios, your heavier laptop if you need one, and stuff like that. That could be your talk. You could merge the functions of a talk into an observation post or a listening post. Any fixed position that serves as your kind of base camp. But rest assured, we will be talking about smaller operations centers and even one-man operations centers in a separate dedicated video. So if you have established that you need some of the functions of a tactical operations center, there are some things to think about. First up is dispersion. Remember, the nature of running all of your communications from a fixed site makes for a fat target for any adversary. The military solution to this is manifold, but the major way of ensuring a survivable talk is constant movement. Constantly moving the talk to new locations ensures that by the time an adversary figures out where you have moved to, you've already moved somewhere else. Granted, with all of the things we have learned in just the past couple of years regarding how modern warfare has changed, we really do have to wonder if the concept of centralized operations centers is survivable at all in today's world. Either way, that's for people with a lot more military-industrial funding to figure out. All I know is that for our civilian talks, decentralization along with constant movement might be a bit more effective if you can swing it. For instance, pushing out some of the capabilities of a talk to outposts or multiple sites might be helpful. Or rather, not really helpful per se. After all, the point of talks is to have everything in one centralized place. But rather, giving up some of this centralization might be preferred for survivability reasons. Up next is security. Security is a huge concern, especially for any situation in which a more prepared citizen audience might need to centralize their communications in a talk. Security is often directly at odds with dispersion. The more dispersed your base camp or patrol base is, the harder it is to secure and the more people it requires to provide security for that site. However, security is relative. If your threats are mostly ground-based, then absolutely you can use the standard patrol base setup that we all know too well. That is statistically the best way to provide 360 degree security in the most types of terrain with the fewest people. But what if our threats are mostly from aircraft or from persistent surveillance devices? Well, in that case, everyone dispersing their positions more than is comfortable might be a better option. This is especially true in locations where either you completely control the ground or it's so remote that adversaries are many, many miles away, but you do not control the airspace over you. This rings true from Vietnam and Afghanistan to Appalachia and Alaska. Security is such a large topic that a lot of other more experienced people have already covered in great depth. We can talk more about this in the future, but for right now, security is very strongly linked with concealment. Concealment is a massive concern, even more so for a prepared citizen. Since we do not have a battalion's worth of troops or air cover or artillery to back us up in most cases, we're going to have to rely on concealment and camouflage a lot more seriously than anyone else. Camouflage and concealment is something that is gaining a lot more traction in the tactical civilian community, which is absolutely awesome. We need to encourage this as much as humanly possible because the average American citizen even right now, is living in the most high-tech, sensor-dense surveillance state that humanity has ever conceived. This is nothing to shake a stick at. This is quite serious. 99% of this surveillance we will not be aware of until it's too late. For me personally, my role is in the information space. I do not shoot people or kick in doors for a living. And even if it was my job, in a fifth generation war, I think a lot of people will spend a lot less time shooting than they think. Either way, I myself dedicate a significant portion of my equipment to concealment gear. Both for flexing to be concealed in various environments, and also for scaling camouflage as needed as we move. The camouflage you use when moving through a swamp is going to be different than an open forest. Camouflage for a static position is going to be very different than what a person would use on the move. We have talked a lot about camouflage and concealment already, and will continue to do so in the future. The bottom line is that camouflage is a lot more important than people think, even for professional forces. So what might all of this look like in the real world? Well, before we take a look at a couple of civilian setups, let's recap what a typical military talk might look like. So here's what the structure might look like. It's just a large room, a conference room, if you will, 
that can house the various desks and chairs for everybody to work in an office setting. Right up front we've got a projector screen and some large maps on the back wall that everyone is facing so that everyone is on the same page when it comes to the common operational picture. Right up front next to the screens are areas for briefing personnel to stand so that when you're conducting turnover briefs or commander's update briefs or whatever kind of briefing needs to go on in the talk, you can conduct that from the front up there so that everyone can see you. And it's a little bit easier to point at things on the map. As we look down from the top, we can see chairs for a seating area for any personnel that might not work in the talk, but still need to get briefing and still need to get some information, right? So if you're having a brief once a day or once every shift change, these people can come into the talk, have a you know 10-15 minute brief, then get out. Having a nice little seating area down in front, in front of the desks where nobody's really kind of you know working or walking is a good area. Also, the area, keeping the area up front, the little briefing area where you can stand and stuff like that, that's a nice little area to walk back and forth across the front of the talk so that you're not walking in between everybody's desks and kind of being, you know, in the way of things like that. As far as the physical layout of the desks of talk personnel, right up front you're going to have your RTOs, usually your comms guys running your radios. Now, these guys can be situated wherever the radios are at, but usually they're going to be up front. This is so that the battle captain, the central person who's kind of running this you know, organization, who sits in the middle of the talk, or even kind of the middle back portion of the talk, they can see their radio personnel, and they can talk to the radio guy as needed. Same thing with the weather guy. The weather guy is going to be up front so that they can, well, mo more easily get to the briefing screen to talk about weather maps and charts and data and things, uh, and also because they're the one who is going to be hounded the most by personnel outside of the talk. That's why the weather guys right up front because they're going to be hit up by the commander, any kind of operational staff, anybody outside the talk, they're going to be coming in that talk at the top right door uh, if we're keeping this kind of layout. They're going to be coming in that door and worrying the weather guy, asking him, you know, when's the next update brief? How's the weather looking for the operation tonight? Stuff like that. You don't want your weather guy to be situated uh, in an area that's hard to get to. You want them in kind of a high traffic area because the traffic's going to come to them one way or another. Just like the weather personnel, your intelligence personnel or your targeting guys are going to be uh, very busy as well. So they're going to be located in a decently central spot uh, next to the battle captain for sure and usually located right next to the weather weather guy. This is mostly because, again, like I mentioned, in most update briefs, weather always goes first, then followed up by intel. That way you can say, all right, cool, if the weather's bad, the weather guy can get up in front of everyone, get up and brief and say, all right, the weather's bad, nobody's going anywhere tonight, all right, cool, then everybody, uh, everybody's time isn't wasted. Likewise, if the weather guy gets up there and says, hey, the weather's cool, we're good to go for tonight, then the, then the intel guy gets up there and says, oh, well, the target's not there tonight, or this operation is going to be kind of a waste of time because they're you know, nobody there, or the target shifted, or we've missed our window, or whatever. Once the intel gets up there and confirms whether or not the mission is kind of a go or a no go, we can move from there. A lot of times, military units on the on the military side of the house are not going to have dedicated weather guys. They're going to have your intel component handling the weather, and this is usually a very bad thing because intel guys are not weathermen, and it takes a lot of skill, believe it or not, to actually be really uh, good weather personnel. Weather is one of those really highly underrated jobs throughout the entire military, and it is absolutely crucial, and it is very hard to get right. You might not ever know it if you've got a good weather guy, because the things just happen, and you don't ever you don't ever notice, and it, you, you kind of take it for granted, but you will absolutely notice if you have a bad weather guy, so just something to keep in mind. So those are kind of like the central talk personnel, your radio guys up front, your weather guys up front, your intel kind of off to the side there, and your battle captain kind of tracking it all. Now all the other support staff to kind of make it happen uh, can vary based on the mission. So for instance, off to the left on this on this particular layout, off to the left of the battle captain is the battle NCO and various operational staff that might be needed for whatever mission it is. Usually a person from the ops department is going to be, you know, your battle NCO, kind of an NCO uh, billet is usually what it is, uh, and you can also have a a spot for operations staff that might be needed for whatever operation it is. So if there's a key planner or somebody like that who's planning an operation and uh, that, the, you know, there is their baby, right? They're the ones who have planned it for the most part uh, and it comes time to conduct that operation, they might have themselves a temporary desk out on the talk floor to actually watch and, you know, make sure their operation goes as they had planned it. Kind of in the back side of things, kind of behind the battle captain in more of a supporting role, you might also have legal representation to make sure that if you're conducting 
conducting any strikes, that the strikes are legal, uh, and that everything's, you know, copacetic on that, on that angle. You might also have medical personnel kind of, you know, sitting alongside legal, uh, not necessarily because they're related, but because, you know, medical personnel, you know, might need to be in the talk as well, depending on how big this whole thing is, right? This is a very large talk. So chances are there's going to be a medical representative on the talk floor who can either serve as messenger or ensure that medical interests are being met. If something's going on in the talk, you know, the weather guy says something or Intel says something or, you know, Intel guys are predicting, hey, there's like an ambush getting ready to go down in 15 minutes. That's something that medical needs to know. And and if the medical guys are, you know, squirreled away at their clinic or at their uh, casualty collection point, they're not going to know that because they're not in the talk, right? So keeping a medical staff person in the talk is a way of keeping their foot in the door and kind of their, you know, ear to the ground with regards to what's going on with operations. You don't see this all the time, but it's usually a, a pretty common uh, thing that's done in most military talks. And then, of course, some of the more transient personnel that you might see are various support staff, various liaisons of different service branches. If you've got some kind of joint operation going on and this technically becomes a jock, you know, uh, you, you're going to have to have desks or places for them. Again, keep in mind, this is for military organizations. You're going to have a lot of uh, different kinds of units being, you know, working together in a lot of uh, the a lot of cases. Also, additional personnel that might not have a specific, like, place to sit on the talk floor or they might not have a desk in the talk but are nonetheless going to be in and out of the doors all the time uh, or or heavily uh, spending a lot of their time in the talk are various personnel off to the side there so your fires personnel your targeting guys your your um, whatever kinds of weapons are being used uh, those kinds of personnel are going to need to have a foot in the talk a lot of times because uh, it's going to be you know your military unit right that's kind of your job other personnel are operations and plans uh, usually they're separate departments, but in a lot of times you'll see, you know, ops and plans kind of get combined to share a workspace. In any case, you're going to have a lot of um, operational personnel, a lot of ops staff, usually having their own staff room outside the talk, but usually really quite close to the talk. Up next is the command suite. Now, the command suite is usually just the office building for the uh, senior staff, senior uh, operations staff, your unit commander, your executive officers, your senior enlisted uh, personnel, even senior civilian personnel, if that's the kind of you know agency you're working with. The high-ranking personnel are going to have offices separate from the talk uh, for whatever reason, either command privilege or just due to the nature of their job. They're not going to have a specific office in the talk. However, the commander of the unit is going to be be in the talk constantly along with senior operations staff. You know, it's it's the central area for a, a unit usually. The command suite usually incorporates the commander's living quarters along with the senior staff living quarters and their, you know, aides as needed. And while we're talking about billeting, you're going to also have to have billeting for the talk staff. Remember, you cannot stand watch 24 hours a day no matter how much, you know, we may want to or how others may want us to. So you're going to have to have shift work being done, right? Usually two shifts or three shifts depending depending on what kind of situation it's in. If this is more of a high-speed unit kind of thing, you're probably going to see more 12-hour shifts being done as the norm, you know, one guy working for 12 hours, then they switch. Uh, that's kind of the way things work for, for the most part. But in any case, the people who work in the talk are going to need to live and spend their time pretty close to the talk. Usually, if you're in a military unit and you're conducting a lot of your operations at nighttime or some of the more kinetic operations are being done at night, your more experienced staff are going to be working at night and your more um, administrative, your more um, maybe maybe more inexperienced personnel are going to be working during the daytime when you know the risks are kind of minimal. Either way, you're going to have on any shift, be it the radio operators or the intel guys or the weather guys, you're going to have a most experienced person on any of these teams and you're going to have to know where that person sleeps in the event that you have to wake them up. So if something happens, you get attacked, there's some kind of base security thing or some kind of raid going down and you don't know what's going on, those staff are going to wake up and go to the talk uh, to, to make sure that that's you know kind of like their battle stations, right, for lack of a better term. So having everyone's tent kind of set up next to the talk, you know, of course dispersed for security reasons, but uh, still quite close to the talk would probably be a good idea. 
Also located near the top would be maintenance personnel. You're going to have a lot of uh, maintenance bays. They're they're going to be where the maintainers are going to be where the vehicles are at. Be it helicopters, be it fixed wing aircraft, or just ground vehicles. You're going to have your maintainers and your maintenance personnel where those vehicles are located. But they still need to know what's going on in the talk. So you might have maintenance personnel either have a direct line or even sometimes in some cases they might actually have a seat on the talk floor just in case something's going on. This happens kind of a lot uh, because with military vehicles especially, uh, they break down kind of a lot and they break down usually in the worst possible at the worst possible times. So if there's a high profile mission going on and you want to make sure that your vehicles uh, have a, you have a plan, you've got a, a jump plan to, to move to a different aircraft if this aircraft is broken, you've got a, another plan uh, just in case this, this vehicle hits an IED, who's going to replace them, this kind of thing. This gets really, really in depth depending on what military unit you're you're talking about, right? But we can again break this down a little bit more simply in a separate video. Similarly to maintenance is medical. Like I mentioned, medical is going to have their own specific facility. They're going to have their own either casualty collection point or a roll three or a roll one or whatever level of, of medical care facility is at this location. They're going to have their own little spot, right? So they're not going to be cluttering up the talk with their stuff. They're not going to be bothered. They're going to have, you know, their casualties being collected and, uh, you know, treated in a field hospital or some kind of uh, medical facility. However, again, they're still going to need to know what's going on in the talk, thus them having a specific person on the talk floor to understand what's going on uh, as it happens. And then also supply and logistics is going to have another foot uh, in the talk as well, sometimes with a physical spot uh, on the talk floor, but most of the time not. Uh, most of the time the supply and logistics guys are going to have their uh, separate facility, their storage depots, and their little cache sites uh, away from the talk, uh, you know, just because of that's you need space for logistics. Right, but if there is again some kind of operation going on that's you know more than just you know a single night, if it's a long time, if you're going to anticipate resupplies or stuff like that, then logistics personnel need to know if there's some kind of emergency and they need to be on the hook to start dropping emergency supplies somewhere. Then logistics and supply guys are going to have to have a physical spot on the in the talk uh, to understand what's actually going on. Now all of this is fine and dandy, right? We understand what a military talk looks like, what you know how the desk are laid out, how the chairs are laid out, the things on the walls. All of this is crucial to understand and it's kind of fascinating if you're in the world, if you have you know a career in a talk, right? It's kind of interesting to see how different entities, units, and organizations set up their facilities to run operations. But what would a civilian talks layout look like? Here's an example of that. Obviously, a civilian talk, if you're talking about just a prepared community, right? It basically a super prepared community watch facility, right? This is what a talk might look like. You're very obviously not going to have as much space or as many personnel as before. You might just have one map in the front and a small little space uh, for a couple of chairs for additional personnel. You're at minimum, of course, going to have your RTO, your radio guys, your battle captain, and your intel slash weather. Like I mentioned with the professional talks, you might not even have a dedicated weather guy. It might just be one intel guy who's doing the best he can, right? So keep that in mind is that this talk in and of itself can actually be literally three people. One radio guy, one battle captain, and one intel guy. And that can be in a, just a three-person talk. Would it be an efficient talk? Well... I guess you'd have to decide that based on the size of operation they're managing. If you're talking about getting a three-person talk to run a several hundred person operation, then no, you're going to have to set your expectations, right? However, it can be done. You can set up very small talks with other supporting personnel located adjacent to you. And just like with a small civilian talk, there are outside entities that you will need to have uh, plans for. And the first one is <laughs> operations and plans. Usually your planners, your operational staff, they're not going, it's maybe just one or two guys, right? And they're not going to be located in the talk. They're going to be squirreled away either at their, how, at their home or in a tent somewhere else. They're not going to be in the physical talk, right? They're going to do their job to you know plan operations and things like that. And then they're just not going to be part of the, the talk itself. Same thing with maintenance, medical 
people, supply and logistics, the same thing applies uh, for a, a civilian talk is that you're going to need to have space for these people outside the talk and understand that they may, you know, come into the talk, they may set up their shop there. You might have all of these people have their offices in one room in somebody's house and that might be your talk, right? With a civilian talk, you're going to be a lot more flexible and a lot more, uh, incorporate a lot more roles that you might not include with a military talk. And some of those additional roles come into play when we look at billeting. So billeting, or basically just a place to sleep, uh, you're going to have to have a place like that for talk personnel. Either it's a tent or a place for them to pitch their own tent outside the building. You know, wh whatever the case is, you're going to have to have a place, a physical geolocated site, next to the talk for talk staff to sleep when they're not on duty, right? Likewise, you're also going to have to have billeting for transient personnel. People who might be coming through your area of operations, you know, either logistics personnel that are moving supplies from one end of the state to another, you're going to have to have some kind of billeting or, you know, some kind of safe house for these personnel, uh, because chances are your talk your, is going to become your headquarters. All of these terms are going to start to blend together, right? Your your command post, your headquarters, your talk, it's all probably going to be in the same room, to be honest. Likewise, we're also going to have to remember that we're talking about the civilian si side of things. If we're going to be operating a talk or having some kind of operation center, right? We're going to have to have spots, in a lot of cases, for families and for rest and recreation. Let us not forget that none of this occurs in a vacuum, right? We are not, in many cases, none of us here in the United States are going to be deployed overseas, like leaving our families behind for a temporary period of time until we can return. That's not how this is working out, even right now. You might need a, an operations center to be set up in a residential home. You might need to have you know, a spot, a room for the kids to sleep, but you know, a, kid, a place for um, you know th their caretakers to sleep, and, and it's kind of in the same spot as the talk. Something to keep in mind is that we're not going to be deploying away from our families for a lot of this stuff. We're going to be setting up these operation centers in very close proximity to our normal civilian lives, right? And that also applies to training. We're also going to need some kind of training capability because remember, in a lot of cases, this is going to be very notional. This is going to be something that we're thinking about in advance. I highly doubt that everyone out there who's watching this is going to just suddenly get together, you know, 15 or 16 of their closest friends and build a talk that they maintain for years. This is more of a theoretical thing to think about for the near future, or if you have a specific need for a talk. You probably already know it, right? So having some kind of training component, having a specific training area or a training location or just a storage area for training, you know, supplies and stuff like that, that's going to be very interesting instrumental to making sure that your talk, even though it might be notional right now, you might only be practicing right now manning a talk, you might only be practicing, you know, going out of the woods and doing tactical operations and stuff like that. This may be practice now, but you need to account for those, those training materials and those uh, training resources. So that's a big difference between civilian talks and military talks in more of like a, you know, deployed location. You're not going to have as many training resources, you know, downrange when you're no longer training. However, in our civilian side of things, we, we might incorporate training a little bit more uh, into our daily lives than, you know, say someone in a deployed zone might. But even something as small as this, a small one room in someone's house, that might be impractical for the average user. There's a fine line between LARPing and really having tactical capabilities. And what we don't want is to set up a talk just for the sake of having a command center. You don't want to have a tactical operations center if you don't have any tactical operations to conduct or even monitor. And that's perfectly fine. In fact, that might be preferable to a more prepared citizenry anyway. Here's what I mean by that. This is what a typical setup might look like for most people. Up front, we've got just a single tent in the woods somewhere, somewhere that's, you know, located on someone's property. Maybe they're trying to set up a talk so that they can track some, you know, logistics operations going on throughout the area. Maybe they've had a, a rash of break-ins or they've had a rash of uh, people, you know, people moving into the area to try to steal stuff. And they're trying to set up, you know, security patrols to their area and they need a talk set up in kind of the middle of the woods, right? You might start with just a single listening post. And that listening post might not have very many resources. It might 
might just have a handheld VHF or UHF radio for the for the occupant to communicate, you know, with everyone around, you know, inner team communications. Uh, they might also have a tablet with an ADSB receiver. They might also have a laptop with an SDR and maybe even a field telephone. So they've got some basic intelligence collection capability and they've got communications capability with people in a different tent. Now you might also set up an observation post. Now this guy in this particular example has got a couple of things going for him. For, well for one he's got a lot of antennas strung up. So this guy can have the HF antenna strung up for invis communications, you know, uh, either more, more close range than say your average HF communications. And he can also set up an HF antenna, you know, via like a collapsible, you know, carbon fiber mast or something like that for more long range uh, HF communications. And this guy can be kind of the the go-to for those longer range communications with maybe say a bigger talk back at like a home base or even just teams you know that are more than a line of sight away from you if, if that makes sense. This guy can also have kind of a, a handheld scanner set up uh, along with an ADSB receiver so he's got some intel collection capability as well right uh, and he can also have a field telephone and this guy can also have the food water and supplies so he can be the logistics guy he can have the, the duffel bag full of food right? And finally, this last guy may be up on a hilltop or in some kind of uh, area where he's got a, a larger field of view. This can be, you know, your more substantial observation post with lots of optics, lots of sensors. If you're into the multispectral kinds of stuff, you know, like thermal, uh, this guy can be that kind of guy set up if he's got the larger field of view. And he can communicate with everyone else via handheld radio or via field telephone. But this guy's just mostly going to be focused on observation and not so much any kind of SIGINT or stuff like that. You can even have a roving patrol of just a couple of people that kind of bounce back and forth between all three of these sites, uh, depending on how far they are dispersed. Again, with if you're trying to use field telephones in the field between, you know, from tent to tent to tent, it's going to be a little harder to do if they're further away. And remember, field telephone line is kind of a dead giveaway if you trip over it in the dark uh, that someone's kind of in your area. So, you know, field telephones are really great to use to keep your MCOM down so that you're not going to be able to be detected by other, you know, those SIGINT capabilities. But we see how the roles of a talk can very much be filled by having three separate sites, you know. There is no one specific structure or location in this example that is the talk. Rather, these responsibilities are dispersed among everyone in the group who is more spread out than you might want to be. Most people will not have enough personnel to warrant a full-blown talk in the middle of the woods, but rather the capabilities of command and control, communications, logistics, intelligence, and operations will be split up among whatever positions are able to be occupied. In other words, most talks will look like nothing more than a listening post with a map hanging on the wall. And again, to address the glaringly obvious problem of security, we really have to examine what the threats are and what our role in a fifth generation war might look like. Look like in the long term. Obviously, if you are conducting combat operations in an area that is a contested environment, the standard patrol based setup is probably best. However, if your role is logistics, making sure that you know, various logistics trains can get from one location to another, or transportation, or medical, or communications, and you are operating in a fifth generation battle space where the biggest concerns are no-knock raids, aerial surveillance, random violent targeting, and even insider threats, Departing from traditional military infantry doctrine might be the better move in that case. If all of this sounds really vague, I'm sorry. It's really difficult to have really specific ideas to convey, but also want to speak to a much larger audience at the same time. The larger point in discussing the talk is to get an understanding of what is required to run anything larger than a squad. A lot of people are organizing their communities, friends, and family members, and that is outstanding. Do more of that. Having prepared and responsible citizens in every community is going to be instrumental in just making it through the hardships of the next few years. But merely surviving is not thriving. Basic preparedness is the baseline. It is the absolute minimum expectation. 
Having a basic community group, even something as simple as a community watch, is the absolute minimum expectation. For those of you who are not in that situation just yet, fear not. That, that's okay. We're going to work on that, right? Uh, we'll come back to that later. But if you want to organize anything beyond the baseline, if you want to do anything beyond basic community defense, then having an understanding of these mid-level logistical, informational, communications, and command needs is vital. Some of you might already be ready for something like this. You've got a good team of people, experienced personnel for protection and defense, family support to help run the household and daily life stuff, and people to help with communications and medical needs. That's great, but if you are at this point, it's probably time to start thinking larger than just your group. How can you coordinate with other groups in your area, or how to run logistical lines of support, or help others get their local group set up? With a setup like this, I can take a four-man team and put them in the most rugged terrain imaginable, and they can serve as an information center, a communications node and relay, and a logistics hub for others operating in the area. And the best part is, at least in our current society, these people will look like a few guys going out for a nice camping trip. You can run a talk that can support and manage three or four fire team sized elements, and the entire operation will look totally innocent to any eyes that might be watching. I can also put this team in a tiny apartment in a city center, running a central location from which safe houses, logistics networks, counter surveillance, and communications can be managed all over a city. There there are going to be plenty of people interested in the boots-on-ground aspect of warfare, the guy stuff, right? The concept of recce or reconnaissance, the light fighter or basic infantry tactics, or even just moving through the woods with rifles and a few friends. All of these things are super popular these days for good reason. But none of this will be possible, certainly not in the long term, without some kind of higher organization and support staff. Understanding the concept of the talk is crucial to start thinking about these smaller but still still important roles that support staff and capabilities play in a tactical environment. For we citizens, we can't radio in a supply drop. We don't have unlimited budgets or technologies. We don't have artillery or helicopters. And we don't have the ability to operate in the open without the consequences that come with living under a massive authoritarian surveillance state. So we've got our work cut out for us. Not only do we have to get really good at surviving, but we have to think about larger operational concerns as well. And we have to do this while living a somewhat normal life with a job and a family to take care of. That's the name of the game. Even if you aren't set up right now with a full-blown tactical community defense team, that's okay. It's worth thinking about administration, logistics, and communications right now. So think about it. Constantly re-examine yourself, your team, and your needs just like you constantly re-examine your tactical gear. There will always be people willing to carry a rifle. There will always be people willing to resist tyranny. And as the situation around the world develops, we are going to have more and more average people stepping up. But if we want these dedicated people to be as capable of a force as possible, somebody has got to focus on the boring stuff that makes it happen. If the world's basic military training schools are any indication, it takes a couple of months to train a complete civilian to become a minimally effective soldier. But it took generations of warfare to develop those schools and basic training programs to even allow that soldier to be trained. In a firefight, when you're getting shot at, it's unlikely that you're going to be thinking about maintenance schedules or cargo shipments. But outside of that tactical engagement, outside of those few minutes of combat, it's the boring stuff that's going to get you resupplied, patched up, rested, and ready for whatever comes next. So we're going to keep focusing on the boring stuff, even if we have to, for now, fight in the shade.